always a privilege to come to the house of the Lord. I have never in my life ever seen one time that I regretted to come to his house. It's, uh, but I suppose this morning is about the hardest time I ever come. Yes. Uh, uh, so, things happen in life. We know that, that we have to face and we must remember that, that it comes to all. And we are very... Thankful this morning I am, and I know my brothers and sister is very grateful to God to know that our mother is saved, and she's old, and we've been expecting this for some time because she's a mother of many, and she has broken her life down. In the days of my mother, they didn't have the things that they have now to take care of mothers when they had their babies, perhaps maybe Mama would have one of the children that morning and get up and do her washing that afternoon. And so now they lay in the hospital several days with all kinds of medications, which is, we are grateful for such things that can help these, these mothers and all. She is uh, very, very near death now. And... Um, I, was, just a, <laughs> just a little hard this morning, but yet I had, I had promised to be here. <laughs> and um, now I can't say that my mother is going. I've often said this, and many are witnesses about visions. I said, if my own mother was laying dying and looked into my face and said, "Billy, what, what's to become of me?" I said, unless God would tell me, I wouldn't know. I, I couldn't say. And that very thing has come to pass. Amen. If mother is going, he certainly has kept it a secret from me. Amen. Before my father died, I saw the vision of him going. When I was yet a sinner, I saw my brother, the first one, he was going. Howard, I told you all two or three years before he went about his going. But mother, he hasn't said a word to me. And if she's going, it's something that I don't know about, although we have the doctor has said that he didn't see how she lived through last Sunday. And um, she's uh, pretty poorly. But however, when I was about a month ago, like I did to Miss Broy, I always like to check up on the people to knowing that they are near the end that to see just how they stand. We must be sure of this. We don't want just to say, well, perhaps it's all right. We want to be positive that it's right. I had a good long talk one morning with Mother. She said, Billy, I, I've lived as long as I should live. She said, I have nothing else to live for. She said, I've got to go. And said, I'd just rather go on and be with Dad. And some of the other children's over there, I get to see you all often. And when she was being put in the ambulance to take out to the hospital to give glucose, because she couldn't eat nothing, they had to give her glucose through their veins. And uh, I said to her when we was putting her in the ambulance, I said, Now, Mama, everything is all right. She said, I am longing to go. And I said, Mama, if you were leaving me a treasure upon the earth of a hundred million dollars for we children, or you were leaving us a home that would reach from city to city. It would not nothing like compare with this testimony that you're leaving us. I am Amen. ready to go. It's a treasure Amen. that money cannot buy. Amen. To know that. So therefore, in the face of that, I stand boldly, believing these things that I have preached. It stands good for my mother. It stands good for other people's mother. It stands good for all of us. 
I could not say, God, don't take her. Because I know that as soon as her mortal soul leaves this body, she has another one waiting. Amen. And uh, she'll be a young woman again in uh, just a few minutes after she leaves here. Did you ever notice a little baby when it's born? It's little muscles twitching and jerking. But when it comes to the earth, it receives a spirit. And then it becomes a living soul. And as soon as the soul goes back from that little body, there is another one waiting for it. See, because first God makes the soul and spirit. It just goes to the bodies. And, and when we leave here, we only change dwelling places and go to another. For if this earthly tabernacle be dissolved, we have one already waiting. So that's our consolation. Now let us pray. Our glorious Heavenly Father, what could we do in these hours of tremendous need if it wasn't for you? But our hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. And we are so glad to know that there is a land beyond the river that when you are finished with us on this earth that we only change our dwelling places to that glorious land yonder where there is no sickness or heartache, death or separation, we will always be with thee and with our loved ones. So we thank thee for this glorious hope that's in our bosom today. And it seemed, Lord, hard this morning for me to come down not to serve you, but to know that I am nervous and wonder just how I will be able to approach this message this morning for the church. And I feel that you have placed upon my heart how the enemy has taken me around and around with it. But I have got this far to the pulpit in your name. And I commit myself with the message and all into thy hands and know that you are more than able Hallelujah. to take it to each heart and to provide everything that we have need of. We commit it all to thee now and ourselves as your service, as my lips as your mouthpiece and the ears as your hearing post. Bless us, Lord, and may other mothers fathers and those who will be in the days to come if the world shall stand may they prepare and know too that they must come down someday to this hour that mother has arrived at I pray God that they will make their preparation today for there is not one more thing in the world that matters no money can buy no popularity can sustain. Nothing can help but God and God alone. And we hold to His unchanging hand, knowing that He has said the footsteps of the righteous is ordered of the Lord. So this little suffering that we have now in present life will mean so little. As the poet has expressed it, the toils of the road will seem nothing when we get to the end of the way. Hallelujah. Now help us, Lord, press on towards the mark of the high calling, knowing that someday in a great beyond here we shall meet in a sweet by and by. Hallelujah. Bless our words now. Bless our servants, each child of God that's in here. May their hearts be warm and stirred this morning. Father, I need some of it myself. I pray that you'll grant it all these things in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Now I notice that here we have a group of handkerchiefs. And I am uh, will get to them just in a little while. I come in from a trip where I have been up on a hunting trip with a man up in near Alaska. You know, this season is kind of a season that I set aside the fall of the year to rebuild myself, making ready for the seasons that lay ahead for the service I am 
not too strong, uh, well, I'd say in my nerves. I have a, a very bad nerve system. And I realize that it takes that type of a system to make the ministry that the Lord has given me. You cannot have everything glorious on the earth. Physically, I'm very thankful for the strong body, but my nerve system, because that you play right on the line between natural and supernatural, and it, uh, it tears you to pieces. And I have never tried to sit down and explain that to my congregations because they would not understand because I don't understand myself. But even to doctors examined me and put in that pressure test of nerves, said they'd never seen anything like it, see, how it'll move from one place all the way to another. I don't understand their scientific research and, or what they have done, their ways of doing things, but I know that... There's something happened to me one day. When Christ got a hold of me, I was changed. And I would just like to say this. It might strengthen me. It seems like it would be a very odd thing to speak of this morning. But just before entering my message to kind of quieten myself, I would uh, like to say that uh, when I give out about being here, I didn't know what mother's going to be sick. And I also gave out the service for tonight. God willing, we'll, I'll be here tonight speaking, if that's all right with the yes, pastor. Sir. And I want to speak on the Comforter has come tonight. Uh, and um, that's tonight's service. And then we have a communion service here tonight. And all peoples are cordially invited to come and, and take this communion with us tonight. And... For the message. It was last spring when I was up in Alaska or up near Alaska in British Columbia to uh, for services that the Lord gave us such a glorious time. And I have always loved outdoors. Can you hear me all right in the back? If you can, raise up your hands way back there. I've always loved outdoors. As anyone knows our family knows that there, my mother dying out there now, her mother was an Indian. And my conversion never changed it and I, my love for outdoors. And I'm glad because it's somewhere I see God. I do not go so much to go out to hunt game. It's, it's to be alone with God. And I hunt alone. And while I was up there, I met some mighty fine guides. That's the fellows in Canada and places before you can go into the wilderness. The game commission signs you to a guide. And that guide has to be with you. And... I met a wonderful Christian brother, young Pentecostal, that was a famous guide in Canada. His wife was a glorious, saved woman, and he's about 40 years old, and they have five little children, little boys, from 18 down to about two years old. And he had been granted a great 500-mile section of the Alcan Road for his guiding space. There's some Indians back in there that did not want to move out, and they were very arrogant and put up a sign, if you come in here, there'll be bloodshed. But yet, we rode on past it and went back because I wanted to talk to those Indians. After all, the land was theirs before it was ours, you know. And um, had a good time with them last spring, telling them about the Lord Jesus and one old man. The old father of the tribe was nearly a hundred he had his, I could see why he didn't want to go. They bury their dead in a log and hang the log up in a tree. They had two little children buried there. Of course he didn't want to leave. I can see why he wouldn't want to leave. And the reservation, of the, uh, the government of Canada, the Dominion of Canada said if they got arrogant, they'd just take them out of there and make them go. Why, you'd hate for them to do that. Their babies hanging there in the trees. And uh, so 
However, the rivers come down and cut us off and we couldn't get back into the country where we were going to hunt grizzly bear. This Mr. Southwick, Southwick it is, was um, the guide and he and I was with a little minister, Eddie Baskell. And um, so this boy, Mr. Southwick, had a, a young brother of about between 25 and 30 years old was seriously plagued with epilepsy. Mr. Southwick has just become a Christian about a year ago. A cowboy before, and they're kind of rough, you know, in their living. And, but he had just become a Christian. And he was believing, and he said, I have read your book, Brother Branham. And he kept hinting along about his brother with the epilepsy. He said, oh, if I could only get my brother to you. Well, you know how it makes you feel? You're helpless, can do nothing, and you just wonder how that it could all happen. Then, in Canada, usually, in man who, you men who go out on trips you know, and handling horses, and I love horses and animals, they usually tie a halter to tail and let them walk in the string, the pack string, but there you can't do it because of shale. You'd lose one horse, you might lose the whole string. So we just have to let them go and wrangle them into the path. And I was way back in the back on a young horse trying to wrangle up the strays and bring them in. And the Holy Spirit in His grace came down. I spurred up my horse and rolled on past the string up to where Mr. Southwick was uh, leading out in the front through the bush. And I said, Bud... He said, yes, Brother Branham. I said, will you take my word? He said, with anything you say. And I said, I have a thus saith the Lord for you. I said, go get your brother from Fort St. John, which is seven or eight hundred miles away. Bring him up on the highway here. And he lived in an old shady with an old salamander there for a stove. Had his children in there. I said, the first time he falls into an epileptic fit, jerk his shirt off of his back. I'll give you something to do. Throw it into the fire and say, this I do in the name of Jesus Christ. He said, I'll do it. So he went, sent and got his brother, brought him up there. And that morning he had to go out on trail with some conservation man. And his brother usually have two or three of those fits a day and had him since his little boy. And his wife was scared to death of him when he had those fits because he got violent. Very strong young fellow. And he fell into a fit after Bud left. Instead of her jumping through the window like she usually did, getting her children out of the way, she just jumped right straddle of him and jerked off his shirt, a little Holy Ghost filled woman. <laughs> jerked off his shirt and threw it in the fire and said, This I do in the name of Jesus Christ. He's never had one since. <laughs> That was last spring. Hallelujah. Many times I know it's been a little hard. People who wouldn't understand say, Brother Bram, why would you take a hunting trip? See, they just don't understand. There's no need of trying to explain it. See? You catch people there, it will never be caught. About two months ago, or hardly that long, I was woke up one morning. I believe I'm not sure I told it to most of the church. There's many here who's heard me tell this before it come to pass. And in the a vision I saw that I saw a great animal look like a deer. And it had great high horns. And it was I had to go around a side shale like this to get to it. And it was a very famous animal. It was a great trophy animal. And there was a man that I saw that had on a green checkered shirt. And then on the road, after I got the animal, I heard a, a voice say that those horns are 42 inches high. That's about this high. And it was a mammoth animal. And on the road back, I saw a great, huge, silver-tipped grizzly bear. Now, that's the famous bear. 
There's four in the grizzly family. One is the silver tip, which is the famous. Next is called a native named Kadish, which is a black with a round ear. The second, the third is a regular grizzly, which is between black and brown, a huge bear. And the next is a Kodiak, which is only found on Kodiak Island and, and western Alaska. He's great mammoth, biggest of all bears, but he's a grizzly. But the silver tip is black and the white is on the silver, is on the end of the tip of the hair. He's the famous and very high-strung, ill-tempered bear. I shot the bear with a hard shot, killed him. But I was questioning the little rifle I had about getting it. And I told the brethren, how many here has heard me tell about that before it happened? Raise up your hands. Well, of course, most of them. And um, so uh, then Mr. Argon Bright called me and wanted me to go to Alaska. Well, instead of going to Alaska, I felt led to go back up here to this trip up here with Bud because I'd promised him. When I got up there, I told his wife and all the people around there this thing. He said, I said, but now which one of you all have a green checkered shirt? Nobody had one. Well, I said, then it must be another trip that I'll take. But somewhere the Lord's going to give it to me. Just exactly. So I, I said, I thought it might be this trip. Well, we went on on the trip in the first day when we got high and above the timber lines where there's no timber up in the glaciers with our horses. And the second day, we hunted some and we found plenty of sheep with three-quarter curls and so forth, but it just wasn't, right? And you talk about a fellowship. Every one of us Pentecostal had the Holy Ghost. We had some time up there to see those colors changing in those mountains and way up in there where only God lives. And such a great time we wouldn't go to bed to one o'clock in the morning, just praising God and having a glorious time. And on the second day, we went out and about six miles back over behind the glaciers, we spotted some big rams and said, well, we'd go back and the next morning at daylight, we'd be on a road. So we started off the next morning before daylight and got by nine o'clock, was up on up where we'd seen in the glaciers. But on the road up, I'd seen my first wild caribou. I'd never seen one. I've seen domestic in Laplands and so forth, but not in caribou, which is not a caribou is a native name. It's a reindeer. And so um, usually they have paneled horns like this, one run right in front of their nose, and then a panel comes out in front, and then the horns hook over with another panel about so wide. But it said to me, maybe, I said, no, no, he, I said, it wasn't a caribou because it didn't have that kind of horns. But that morning going up, I, I'd seen uh, the cow and calf, and we went over to one side, and I spotted a young bull running, and Brother Eddie wanting to feed the Indians, or he's a missionary, there's a fine man come out of a lovely home and a wife just out of a swell home and their arms is eat up in here and sore with fleas where they live with the Indians and things out there trying to bring Christ to the Indians. It takes grace to do that. Live out there on peanut butter and molasses and sleep in those huts where bed bugs, fleas and everything just eat them up like that yet to bring the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so... Brother Eddie had slipped around the hill and I sat there just in awe for two hours when I seen the great snow peak mountain. I thought, Lord, God, let me live here during the millennium. See them yellow Quakers down on the hill and the red buck bush and all blending in with that big snow capped mountain reflecting down into the lakes. There's just something about it. I just sat there and cry and cry and cry. Because only God alone can paint that. There's nothing to do it. See? And I sat there and I have to think, well, I wonder what become of Brother Eddie. I went over to Bud, and he was sitting over there rejoicing in it, too. About two hours, we got up, and I seen Eddie's movie camera laying right up there on the top of those mountains. There's nothing but caribou moss, this moss. It's on above where timber won't grow. And I noticed him down the hill. He put his fingers up like this. He is stalking this young bull caribou. Well, he, he shot the caribou, and we just dressed it out, went back up on the hill. And I, we got down low enough, we'd get some water. And I was just looking around with the glasses. Somehow, about two miles from me, there laid my animal. I seen him. I said, that's him. That's the one. I said, look here, see this shale we have to go around the side? And I said, the only thing is a green checkered. And I looked and Eddie had on a green checkered shirt. I said, Eddie, I thought you... He said, Brother Branham, I did 
My wife must have put that in there. She said, I got a clean shirt this morning, but I didn't know. I said, my wife must have put that in there. God never fails one thing. He just perfectly. There he had the green checkered shirt. The guide said, Brother Brown, I don't know how you ever get around to that. I said, I don't care if he's 50 miles away. He's mine. I said, he belongs to me. And we started off around that shale, just all oh, that steep, just around the sides. And we got over there, and I got the big caribou. And, and instead of it having panels, it had spikes. Never seen one like it. See how odd how God does things? So we told the boys to go down the draw and take the horses and pick up the meat and meet us down at the bottom when we come down. Because Brother Bud looked around and said, Brother Bram's vision, if it was true about my brother being healed with epilepsy, he'll get that animal regardless of where it's at. So he said, you just meet us, we'll have the head and down there. And so when we got it skinned out, the skin and horns and all would be about 125 pounds, just not the body skin, just the cape skin. So then he said, now, Brother Branham, so I want to ask you something. said, I could hardly skin in here. He and I both went on each side. He said, you say these horns are 42 inches? I said, yes, sir. He said, they look like 90 to me. I said, they're 42. And he said, I've got a measuring tape in my saddlebag. I said, all right, you'll see this exactly. He said, then according to what you have told me, Somewhere between here and where we meet them boys with that green shirt on, you're going to get a silver-tipped grizzly bear. said, I've never seen one. And I've lived in these mountains all my life. I said, but it's thus saith the Lord. Amen. I said, you know where he's at? I said, no, but he's somewhere between here and them boys. We can see right down where he's at, about three miles down the timberline. I said, we'll get him. Oh, that's something. He said, then we'll be down there within an hour and a half. And you mean to tell me that you're going to get a monstrous big grizzly bear, a silver tip, somewhere between here and them boys? I said, that's according to his word. He said, he's there. So we got the horns saddled up, up on our heads and dragging and down the hill we went to, we got to the glaciers. And when we got to the glaciers, it was so hot. We had to get in the glacier a little to cool off. We passed over the glacier and went down until we hit where water was coming out below the glacier and down along into the, beginning to get into the timber. We just sat down to rest and I turned and looked. I said, look, bud. About like a cow. About two miles away. He threw the glasses up, looked and said, Brother Brandon, so help me. It's a silver tip. He said, look at him glistening in that sun. I said, that's him. I said, well, let's go get him. So that's what we did. Went and got him. Caught in the vision. It was too late to skin it then. We had to wait till the next day. Then after we got the grizzly, come back down. Then he said, and you say them horns, said if them horns are 42 inches, Brother Bram, I'm going to faint. And I said, you don't have to faint, but they're 42 inches. That's what they are. <laughs> so we got down to the and I thought in the vision, you brethren that raised your hand, sisters, a while ago had heard me tell this before it happened. I said, it must have been Billy Paul. It was a little boy. You all remember me saying that? Some little hand. But his boy's 18 years old and just the size of Billy Paul. See? And when I got down there, there stood Eddie with his green checkered shirt on. I seen that little hand go around those horns. And when he went over and got the tape measure, laid it down on here and Help, that little boy put his hands up. I said, look, Eddie, them little hands on the horns. And when he pulled the tape measure up like this, he looked at me and turned real white in the mouth. He said, Brother Brandon, look here, just snug 42 inches exactly. <laughs> you might say, Brother Bram, why do you say that on a Sunday school? I'm saying this for this reason. Back in the Old Testament... The old sages and prophets of those who've gone on. They worshipped a God of heaven. Who showed them visions. They loved a God through His grace that loved them. They longed for a city somewhere or something within them. They left their homes and they become pilgrims. 
Because they were seeking a city somewhere. They told things that we see happening today. That same God who loved them and by His grace and done those things for them is the same God that we serve here at this tabernacle this morning. Doing the same things. And there is in our bosom a longing for that city. Somewhere where they have gone to. And by His Word and by the signs of His power with the same Spirit and the same prophecies, the same thing that He did back there to them, He's doing for us today. Amen. And you see it with infallible proof that it is God and God's truth. So wherever that great city is and wherever they are gathered, I'm expecting to see that dying mother of mine and all of you with them over in that city there with those Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Daniel, Isaiah, Jeremiah. Because the same grace of God that loved them and gave them visions and showed them things to come is the same God today doing the same thing for us. Infallibly, truth, it is the truth, friend. Our Heavenly Father, we are grateful why you wanted me to have those things. I guess, Lord, you're just encouraging me knowing that there was a shock coming. I don't know. Thou does know. And I know I'm no more a boy. i not the little boy that used to hang on to Mama's apron. But I'm a middle-aged man now. Oh, how I love you, Lord. How I believe you. Give us grace now. Help us to teach thy word that others might see and learn and know of thee. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. For a text this morning, I think that's all I had to say. Well, services tonight, communion, feet washing, so forth, it's all... Um, I've invited you to stay and be with us. Before our text this morning, let's turn over in the Bible to St. Matthew's, the third chapter, to read a portion of the Scriptures. I want to begin... At the tenth verse of the third chapter of St. Matthew. And I know there's many standing and we hate for that. But if some of you will change off with them once in a while, I excuse me for being taking my time, but I you understand. Now the scripture reading. Now also the axe is laid unto the root of the tree. Therefore every tree which bringeth forth not good fruit is shewing down and cast into the fire. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. But he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Whose fan is in his hand, he will thoroughly purge his floor. And gather his sweet into the garner. But he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Then cometh Jesus of Galilee to Jordan to be baptized of him. But John forbid him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee. And comest thou unto me? And Jesus answering said unto him, Suffer it to be so now. For thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. And he suffered him. I would like to take the text from that word there in the 15th verse. 
Suffer it to be so now, for thus it is becoming to us to fulfill all righteousness. Oftentimes I have wondered why that, that Jesus of Nazareth, and many times it's been asked me, why would a man like Jesus have to be baptized? Why would this person be baptized as a knack of repentance and of confession when he was a holy, spotless, unadulterated son of the living God? Why would this person have to be baptized like a man coming? Baptism is after confession. He had no confessions to make because he was God. And he, why would he have to be baptized like he had unto repentance? Because he needed no repentance. For he was the infallible God. He was in the world and the world was made by him. And the world knew him not. Why would he have to be baptized? And did you notice the phrase before that said, Thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. In other words, it must be fulfilled all the word that God has spoken. It must be fulfilled. God cannot say anything without having it fulfilled. When He has spoken it, it is a finished work. It's already finished when God speaks it. God never speaks on until he's ready for it to be. And when he speaks, it's just as well as already happened. Now, if that wouldn't give us a basis to put our faith on this morning. When God speaks the word, it's already finished. What about his promises that he's given to us? Everything that he has said, it's already a finished work. So therefore, when we receive His Word into our heart, it's, a, it's already done. It's completed. And why would He then, it doesn't answer the question, be baptized? Many have said, well, He was baptized because He was our example. That is true to a certain state, certain place that is true. But it isn't all the truth. The truth of it was that He was the antitype. He was the high priest. And before the high priest could be anointed, he had to be washed. I want to read some scripture for you just a moment. Over in the book of uh, Exodus. And um, I think it's the 29th verse I have wrote. uh, 29th chapter, rather. And uh, I want to begin here at the 4th verse of the 29th chapter. And Aaron and his sons thou shalt bring unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation and shall wash them with water. Thou shalt take thou shalt take the garments and put upon Aaron and the coat and the robe and the ephob and the ephob and the breastplate and the gird him with the curious girdle of the alphab, and now shall put the merit upon his head, and upon the holy, upon the crown, upon the merit. And thou shalt take the anointing oil and pour it upon the head and anoint him. See, Aaron, the high priest, before he could ever be anointed, he had to be washed with. Water. Therefore, when Jesus, before he could be anointed our high priest, he was washed with water. And then not anointing oil poured up on him, to anoint him like Aaron was, anointed with oil, he was anointed with the Holy Ghost. For John bare record, seeing the Spirit of God descending like a dove and going upon him in a voice saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I'm pleased to dwell in. 
So the Bible said that Jesus was anointed with the Holy Ghost, went about doing good things, see. He was anointed, and before he was anointed, he had to fulfill all righteousness. Amen. See? He had to be washed with water before the anointing come up on him. And it's a very beautiful type of us today as priests unto God. We must be first baptized. Confess our sins and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, Amen. washing away our sins, and then you shall receive the anointing, Amen. the gift of the Holy Ghost. Think, wash first and then anointed for the service. No minister should enter the pulpit without first being baptized. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus Christ, because His only remission of sins is only in Jesus Christ's name. On another, another name under heaven given among man, repentance and remission of sin Amen. must be taught in His name, Amen. beginning at Jerusalem. That's where the Holy Ghost fell and anointed first. So a minister or any believer must first be washed from his sins in the name of Jesus Christ and then anointed with the Holy Ghost to bring forth a testimony for God. Hallelujah. And Christ was God's testimony because God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. Amen. Now he said, suffer this to be so, John. That is right. In other words, John, you are a mighty man. You are a great, mighty prophet. And your revelation of me is exactly the truth. You know who I am. You know, because your ministry didn't come from man. Your ministry came from God. You never learned it of man. You wasn't taught this in a seminary. But at the age of nine years old, you went into the wilderness because you were born to odd, peculiar child. And from your very birth, God began to deal with you. And even before your birth, the prophet saw you. And you are a light of this day. And in the wilderness, you know who I am. Because God in the wilderness told you there would be a sign following me. And you've already bore witness of it. And you know it. And we know who each other are. We know each other. And it, it is true that you need to be baptized in me. But let's suffer that to be so for John. If we are the lights of this day, we must fulfill all righteousness. Amen. All God's word must be fulfilled by us for this Amen. day. For it is becoming to us, behooving. It's becoming, it's like us. For if we are the true witnesses of God today, John, we are the lights of this age. And if we are the lights of this age, say so much scripture that's got to be fulfilled during this age, and it's up to us. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It's up to us to see that all God's righteousness is fulfilled. Oh, glory. Help us. And what is his righteousness? His word. In other words, John, you know who I am. I am the high priest. That's true, John. And I have need to be baptized of thee, but we've got to fulfill all righteousness. And I have need to be baptized of thee now to fulfill the word of God. Because Amen. all the words got to be fulfilled. Amen. And we are the lights of the day. And it's up to us to fulfill all this. And I know that your righteousness and your uh, desire is to fulfill the word. It will be coming to us. We are the lights. The light of every age should do the same thing. We know what's to be fulfilled. You are spiritual and know the Word of God. You see what God has promised. Now, the Word will not come just easy, but it comes by observation. You've got to press your way into do it. Amen. But yet... It behooveth us, it is becoming to us, to fulfill all God's righteousness. 
We must do it. And now Jesus did recognize in John that John was a true prophet. The Word had spoke of John. And he knew that he was absolutely the prophet of the hour. And John knew that Jesus was the Messiah of the hour. And they both clearly had an understanding. Oh, if the church of the living God could only get that into their heads this morning in their hearts. That the church would not be separated by denominational barriers. That differences in creeds and colors and so forth. That we might come together in the name of the Lord Jesus not having anything to bear us away from the true word of the living God and walk straight down that line of Scripture Amen. to fulfill all God's righteousness of today. Or anyone knows that we're living in the evening lights. The prophet said, It shall be light in the evening time. And so we know that we're living in that hour. The hour of the evening lights. So the Lord God help us to realize that. Yeah, Let's go back just for a little bit and take up some characters that knew their position in their day and was willing to stand criticism or anything else that the Word of God might be fulfilled. Amen. Hallelujah. Let's take for instance Noah and his day. It was becoming of Noah after he had met God and had known God's plan for the day. Now, you cannot do anything unless you know what you are doing. You must know that it is the will of God. You must know that it is His plan and His desire. And it's revealed to you. Then there's nothing going to stop it. Amen. Now Noah knew because he had not got his ministry from some school of education. But he had talked face to face with God. And he knew that there was coming a flood. He knew that the rains would pour out of the sky like rivers opening up. Although it was firmly against scientific uh, matters in that day, the scientists no doubt criticized Noah and said, We can scientifically prove to you that there's no water up there. For they were a great age then, greater than we are today, more scientific than we are today. You know, Jesus referred to it as it was in the days of Noah. How they built the sphinx and the pyramids and things that we could not touch building today. And they were great scientists. They had colors and things and embalming fluid in that day that they could make a mummy. We could not do it today if we had to. They were farther advanced than we are. And they could prove that there was no water there. But just the same it was becoming to Noah. After he had known the plan of God, that he hammered away on the ark just the same. For he knew that only that ark would be the only thing that would float. No matter if it was scientifically proven there was no water there, if the word of God had said it would rain, it's going to rain. Amen. And may I stop here to say this because of the sick people? If your case is so bad that maybe the doctor says that there is not a hope, what difference does that make as long as God says to you, I'm going to let you live? Amen. Hallelujah. What if the doctor or some scientist would say, your religion that you speak of, the Holy Spirit, and you're speaking in tongues and your and your manifestations, is just a mental illusion that you are not filled with the Holy Spirit. That there is no such a thing. 
And many thousands of clergymen declare that today. That you're just all worked up. That there is no such a thing. And then some of them said to me, why don't you join some good denomination and use your influence to further that denomination? And said, uh, now this your Pentecostal group that you're fooling with, they're just a bunch of religious uh, quacks. And the day. there's no such a thing as that. They're just mentally worked up. Yeah, that's right. They, they, they don't have what they're talking about. We can prove that they don't have it. Oh, brother, you're just too late. We know what we have. We are born again of the Holy Spirit. For we see His works right among us just like it was in the Bible time. If you believe in that same Holy Spirit, then why isn't He doing the same thing in your church? Because he cannot change, he's God. So no matter what the scientific proofs are that we are just emotional, that we're just mentally upset, that there is really nothing to this great religion of ours, that it, it's not just what it should be, and so forth like that, that we are just a bunch of outcasts. Don't believe it. Don't believe it. If your daughter happens to come home from school and says, Mama... Uh, we are uh, well, proved today that the the skull of the human being is uh, just like that of the Japanese. See, or uh, we are uh, uh, we have studied and and we know that uh, we all came from one single cell. That we're we're just animals. Don't you believe that? Amen. And no matter what anybody says, any theologian, any doctor, any scientist, any teacher. You hold on to God's Word. Amen. For remember, we are building as Noah was in his days. We are building an ark. Hallelujah. And Noah knew that if he didn't get that ark completed, that not only his own household could be saved. So he knew God's plan in the midst of criticism. It didn't bother him one bit. He hammered right away on that ark. Amen. So no matter how much they say there's no such a thing as the baptism of the Holy Spirit, there's no such a thing as divine healing, it behooveth us, it is becoming to us that we fulfill hey, all wow. righteousness, hey. that we stand in this hour of trial and pound Hallelujah. away at the ark of the Lord. Hey. If they say that, brother, you're all mixed up in your baptisms and so forth, there is, you shouldn't be, Baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. I was talking to a lovely couple last evening. And there's a young man who has just been baptized. And believes that there is only one God. And in a businessman's meeting they won't let him testify. Because he don't believe there's three gods. Now, no matter what they say. Hallelujah. It's behooving to us. Amen. It's becoming to us. That we fulfill all righteousness. The word will remain the same when businessmen associations and all is gone and churches will be no more. God's word will ever remain the same. It becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Has not the prophets prophesied of this day? Remember those critics... It's becoming to them to fulfill that too because it must be fulfilled also. But Noah, it bothered him not. He went right ahead because he knew God's program. Amen. He knew what God was going to do, brother kid. He knew God's layout because he had talked to God. Amen. And it was according to the Word of God. Amen. And he went right on doing it anyhow. Amen. Whether science could prove it or anything else or how much criticism is put upon Noah, he stayed right with God's Word and pounded right away. Why? It was becoming to him because Noah was a prophet. And it was becoming to him that he kept the Word of God. He stayed with it. It's becoming to any prophet, true prophet of God, that he stays with the Word. Regardless of what science can say and what uh, this can prove this or that, so forth, it, it's, it's becoming that, 
that it fulfilled all righteousness. All right. They sent word for me to pray for mom right away. Pray for her now. Doctor's just left. All right. Now, Lord Jesus, I'm standing here. Uh, that's my mother. If she's going, I commit her soul into the hands of God. But here's a message that's got to go on, Lord. There's living here that's got, got to die. You help me, Lord. I'm yours in Jesus' name. It's becoming to us. It's becoming to me now. That I fulfill all righteousness. God's word comes first. No love like God's love. Now, Noah, no matter what the criticism was upon Father Noah, he knew where he was standing. And so he stayed right with the word. And he built the ark for the saving of his household because it was becoming to him to do so. It was becoming to Noah to to do so. It's becoming to every Christian to stand by the Word. Exactly right. Stand by God's Word. Heavens and earth will pass away. You will pass away. I'll pass away. Churches will pass away. Organizations will pass away. But God's word shall never pass away. Be faithful. Faithful pilgrim. In the days of Enoch, just before the flood, when Enoch looked out there and saw Noah building away on that ark, Enoch was a prophet. Enoch knew that he was a type. And he knew that before the floods came, that he had to give an example. So one afternoon, it was becoming to him to take a walk. It was becoming that he'd take this walk with God. And somehow that day he changed his path. Instead of going around the side of the hill, he took the king's highway. And he just kept on walking. And they found him not because he was not. But he walked on up the king's highway. Oh God, let me be like Enoch. When the hour comes that I must take the path. Let me find the king's highway. I can see Enoch. As he knew it was becoming to him. For he was a prophet. And he knew what was going to happen. So I can see him kiss his wife goodbye. And say, darling, I'll uh, see you later. Take off his children and kiss them goodbye. And go down to his married son, his married daughter, and kiss them goodbye. And say, where are you going, Father? Are you going out for a, a little walk? Yes, going for a stroll. <laughs> but he never took the old familiar path that day. He took the king's highway and he went on to glory. It was becoming to him to do so. He didn't want to leave, but yet it was becoming to him that he fulfilled all righteousness because he was a type of the church today. He was a type of the church that's going to take an afternoon stroll one of these afternoons. We're going to strike the king's highway and away we'll go. Yeah, it was becoming to Noah. It was becoming to Enoch. That they fulfill all righteousness. Then I want to speak of another man here. There was a man named Daniel. And he lived in a day of critics. You know the children of Israel had been taken from their homeland down into Babylon. And there they were sad. And for some 70 years they had been down there. But there was a young prophet that went down with them. By the name of Daniel. And he and a little group, just a little handful of brethren, had got together and had vowed themselves to God that they were not going to defile themselves with the 
with the modern trend of that day. They wasn't going to fool with the king's meats. They wasn't going to drink his strong drinks. They wasn't going to attend his parties. But they were going to keep themselves holy and dedicated to God. For thus it was becoming to them. It was becoming to Daniel because he was a prophet that he stayed with the word. Any true prophet that knows the word of God. That if he don't know the word of God, then he's not a true prophet. A true prophet stays with the word. Whatever the word says, they stay right with it. No matter what the trend of the day or what the, the modern church says or what someone else says or somebody else does something else, the true prophet stays right with the Word. And Daniel knew that if he stayed with the Word, what it cost him? It's going to cost him his popularity. It's going to cost him his fellowship with the rest of the brethren. It was going to cost him a lot of things, but they made an issue that they was going to pray to a certain God. Then after that, they could go back and pray to any God, but... You know something about God? We don't compromise with God. There's no comprom- compromising with God. God just stays God. He don't expect us on Sunday to be Christians, praising Him and worship Him, and on Monday wishy washy and take it down. And uh, all kinds of thoughts that maybe I was wrong and I ought to have done this or that. We stay right centered on God's Word and lay right to it. So we find that Daniel, it was becoming to him as a prophet to stay with the Word regardless. So there was a degree went out and said that whosoever will worship any other God besides the God that they had selected. In other words, if you don't cooperate with us, we'll just uh, throw you into the lion's den. Well, it was becoming to Daniel. It was becoming to him that he fulfilled all righteousness. That he worshipped no other God or entangled himself with the world only to God only. So he just threw back the shutters and threw up the sash and opened up the curtains and looked out towards the east and prayed three times a day just like he always did. Why? Wow. Not slip off somewhere and hide to do it, but he opened up the windows. Let anybody see that wants to. He wasn't ashamed of his religion. Because it's becoming to a Christian not to be ashamed of your religion. As Paul of old said, in the way that's called heresy, crazy, that's the way I worship the God of our fathers. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, he said. For it's a power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes. That's right. Not ashamed of the gospel. It's a thing that holds in the hours when the ships are rocking and every star's out of sight and the moon and stars and storms are blowing. It still holds. For it's the gospel of Jesus Christ. Daniel was faithful. It was behooving to him. The Hebrew children, it was behooving to them. Becoming them. After they had took their stand for God. is becoming to them. They didn't care about the fiery furnace. Under hard trials, what did they care? They had took a stand. Oh God. If Christians of the day could only see that. I'll take my way with the Lord's despised few. I've started in with Jesus. Oh Lord, take me through. Under trial, Amen. troubles, heartaches, death, sickness, sorrow, Amen. I still cast my love on oh, Jesus my. Christ to take my stand. For on Christ the solid rock I stand all other grounds and sinking sands. Everything else is sinking. Kingdoms will fall and nations will break and denominations will scatter and Theologians will die, but God's Word will ever remain the same. Yes, it was becoming to them that they took their stand. And it was becoming to them after taking a stand that they remained on their stand. When you come this morning believing that God is going to heal you, and you take your stand... It's becoming to you that you never testify anything contrary to it. Or don't come. That's right. 
If you don't feel like that God would heal you, then stay away. You're only making a mock out of it. If you feel this morning when the altar call comes that I want to take my stand for Christ. If you feel, count the price. Count your man. See if you're able to go to battle. See if you're ready. If you don't feel like you're ready, don't come. But if something tells you this is my day, this is my morning, then you come and ever remain there. Don't you move at all. No matter if death faces you, the fog's floating into your face, what do you care? Stand there, for heavens and earth will pass away. My word shall never fail. You'll stay with it. When you say, I believe Jesus Christ is my healer. I believe this morning that he's going to heal my sick body. Something told me to come to the church. I'm here amongst the believers. I'm taking my stand this morning. I believe it. I'm going up to be prayed for. When I'm prayed for, there on that stand, I'll remain. No matter how dark it gets or where it's at, I'll still stand on that stand. You took your stand because it's becoming to you. After you've once made a confession, you must stay with your confession. That's right. It's behooving you as a Christian, as a believer, to stay with your conviction. Don't let the devil push you off here and there. You're always mudded up. You're always off the main road. You're always in and out. And that's why you can't stay to war. You can't have confidence in yourself or you can't. No one can have confidence in you. You've got to stand. And when you've done all you can do to stand, then stand. Hallelujah. Just keep on standing. That's right. We must do that. It's becoming to us. It's behooving us that we do it. It was behooving to Elijah. Becoming to Elijah the prophet. And he made his stand to fulfill the word of God because he knew the word of God. And he knew that this Archbishop Jezebel and all their denominational differences blended in with the trend of the world. He was becoming to Elijah as a prophet. Oh, amen. That he stood and he stood alone. Said to God, they're all gone with me and I stand alone. That's as far as he knew. God said he had some more. That's taking the same stand. Maybe not in the place that da- uh, Elijah was because he was a target to the nation. They didn't get criticism like he did because it was all fire not at him because he was the prophet. But it was becoming to him in the midst of trial, in the midst of criticism, in the midst of indifference. It was becoming to Elijah as a prophet to take the stand of God and stand there. Amen. It becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. That great mighty man foreshadowing this day when the Jezebel religions and things is raising up now. Things that we have today trying to take over is becoming to a servant of God. No matter what anyone says, what takes place, stand because it's becoming to us that we stay with the word. Elijah knew he was a prophet. He saw visions. God had vindicated him to be a prophet. So no matter if his brother, there were tens of thousands, just look at the Israelites, millions of them. People who claimed to believe in Jehovah. They had organized themselves. They went modern. Like they are today. They went modern. They compromised on his word. Hallelujah. But it was becoming to him, Elijah. That he fulfilled all righteousness. So he stood there alone, crying out against the evils. If they took his life, what of it? It It's becoming to him to fulfill all righteousness. There was evil in the land. There was a difference in the land. There were scriptural wrongs in the land. And it was becoming to Elijah to fulfill all righteousness, to stand for Jehovah. And Jehovah stood for Elijah. Amen. 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 Becoming to him. Abraham. It was becoming to Abraham to separate himself 
from unbelief. The coming to any believer to separate yourself from unbelief. Abraham, it was becoming to him to walk in a land of his own. Him and God alone. Because he was a prophet. The world didn't understand why Abraham made such a choice. Why did he leave his home? Why did he leave his church? Why did he leave his people? Why did he do such a rational thing? To sojourn in a strange land where there is no water or food. Why did he go into those bleach deserts where man had not went yet? But it was becoming to him. For he was a prophet. To separate himself from all unbelief. And to walk alone with God. God said, separate yourself and I'll bless you. When you separate yourself from all unbelief, God will bless you. And it's becoming to every one of us. Regardless of the price to separate ourselves from the unbelieving world. Come out from among them and be separate. I will receive you. It's becoming to us as men and women of God to take our stand in this dark hour that we're living. Abraham, regardless of what the rest of them thought, he separated himself. Why? He had saw God. He saw a vision. The vision was true. The vision come to pass. He knew God was with him. Abraham, to make such a rational statement as he did, a man of a hundred years old and a wife ninety, Amen. and she was barren, and he was still, and they were going to have a baby at this age, while well, the medical science of that day would have called him some kind of a, uh, erratic. They'd have called him crazy. But it was becoming... Sometimes it's becoming to become erratic. If it's according to the word. God has spoke to him and said, Abraham said, yes, Lord. I'm the God of your fathers. I'm the God of eternity. I'm El Shaddai. I'm the bosom. I'm the breast. I'm the strength giver. I don't care how old you are, Abraham. What's that to me? Amen. I don't care how sterile you are, how barren your wound is. I'll give you a son. And Abraham said, I believe you, God. Yeah, 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 yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hallelujah. All right. All right. The Bible said he staggered not at the promise of God to unbelief. Oh, but was strong giving praise to God. Why? It was becoming to him. He had saw the hand of God move in power. Oh, Brown Tabernacle. Oh, Amen. What kind of a word will we give it today of judgment? When we've seen His mighty hand. We've seen His power. Amen. We've watched His glory. We've seen what He said that never fails. Amen. We've seen His person. The great pillar of fire, a light hanging in the room here. We've seen it yonder. Science is taking the pictures of it and everything. And hear the message go forth right straight on the line. Amen. Separate yourself from, don't associate with anything of unbelief. Amen. It's becoming to us that we fulfill all righteousness. Abraham professed he was a pilgrim and a stranger. He had nothing to do. He knew nobody on earth. He walked with God because it was becoming to him. For he had seen. It was becoming to Abraham. When all those kings met out there, you know, to make him a great big guy. All the kings after Abraham had got this great victory. When the kings met him out there, all the denominational brothers and said, You know, Abraham, we'll, we'll make an agreement with you. We're going to do so and so. He said, I won't take from a shoe latch to me. Amen. Not that you'd say, I made Abraham something. Oh, it was becoming to him. Amen. For he knew, hallelujah, that God swore to him, I'll oh, give you everywhere you look, east, north, west, or south. All right. What difference does it make whether we got a nickel or a dime? Whether we got something to eat or whether we have it, whether we're living or dying, God promised the meat shall inherit the earth. It behooveth us, it's becoming to us, that we live like it, act like it, let's fulfill all righteousness. God wants men and women who will stand and fulfill all righteousness. Of course, righteousness is His Word. 
As I said at the beginning of the sermon, that's the reason Jesus was baptized. No matter how it was, if he claimed to be the Son of God, then be baptized for remission of sins. Yeah, no, but he had to be washed because he was the high priest. He had to fulfill all righteousness. He says, suffer it, John. I know that you know it. I know that I know it. And we know one another. But we'll suffer that to be so. But thus it's becoming to us. Hey, Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. That I will take away with the Lord this past you. Well, it's becoming to me. Amen. It's becoming to you as servants of God that we take away with the Lord's despise. That we walk godly, righteously, holy in this present life, laying aside every weight that is easily beset us, looking to the author and finisher of our faith, Jesus Christ. Amen. It was becoming to Abraham when he walked up there and God told him not to take this little boy. Now you're a hundred and about twenty years old. You got a little boy here, a little curly head. He's a sweet little thing. But I want you to take him up down the mountain and offer him up for a sacrifice. Yeah. By him, I'm going to make many nations out of you. How could it be? Looks like God got all twisted up. I'm going to take through Isaac and bless the whole world, every nation with him. But I want you to take him up there and kill him. Through Isaac's seed. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. Yeah. Hallelujah. Through Isaac's seed, I'll bless every nation under the heavens. Amen. But I want you to take him up there and kill him. Oh, that stern, sturdy old father. Oh, with the wood and the sack across his back, leading the donkey. My, little Isaac walking in front of him. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief. Amen. It was becoming to him. Amen. Or Abraham said himself, I received him as one from the dead. Yeah. And I'm fully persuaded oh, glory. that God's able to raise him up again. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. It was becoming to Abraham to fulfill all righteousness. Yeah. He knew what he was talking about. He knew his God. He knew what God said God's able to perform. What promise God made, God's able to keep his promise regardless. So it was becoming to Abraham that he fulfilled all righteousness. It was becoming to the disciples at Pentecost to go to that upper room. Why? Why was it becoming? Because they had met a man, a carpenter, known to the world, a Galilean stranger with a bad name, illegitimate. But they had seen that man Raise the dead. Amen. They'd seen that man open blinded eyes. They'd heard that man preach the unadulterated God's word. Oh, praise the Lord. And they know that he was Messiah. They'd seen all the signs around him. They'd heard God speak back from the heavens. They'd seen that pillar of fire hanging over him. They know that he was the Messiah. And when he told them, it's expedient for me that I go away. But I want you to go up there to the city of Jerusalem and stay up there. Right. Just wait there. Amen. How long until? Hallelujah. How long will that be, Lord, just until? Amen. Until you're endued with power from on high. Right. Then you'll be my witnesses. How long will it last, Lord? Uh-huh. Unto this generation, unto that generation, and as many as the Lord our God Amen. shall call. Amen to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the utmost parts of the earth. But before you go, I want you to wait. I'm going to do something for you. It was becoming to them that they went in the upper room because they had seen His power. They know that He died dead, died so dead that even the moon and stars witnessed He was dead. They hid their face and wouldn't shine. The earth thought he was dead until it rocked with a nervous prostration. The rocks belched out of the ground and had been in there since the end of Lubin destruction. They know that was Messiah. They know that his word was that he was to send back the Holy Ghost. They know that was a promise. They know that they had to wait up there for it. They had seen him. They know he was dead. They know he was risen. They had seen him. Therefore, they know what they were talking about. Until a man knows what he's talking about, he can't say very much. But when you know what you're talking about, 
If you think this is excitement, come get it once. Then you'll know what you're talking about. Hallelujah. It's not excitement. It's a power of God into salvation. It's the Holy Ghost. I know what I speak of. Everyone has received Him knows what they speak of. It was behooving to the disciples. It was becoming them that they should keep His word to wait up at Jerusalem. So they went up to wait at Pentecost until they received the Holy Ghost. For then they know their ministry could not go on until they had received the Holy Ghost to bear a record of Him. They know they were helpless, but they had to have His presence. So they went to wait for it. It was behooving to Peter after Jesus had met him in Mark 16. He said, Go into all the world and preach the gospel. These signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall cast out devils, speak with new tongues, take up serpents, drink deadly things, and not harm them. If they lay their hands on the sick, they shall recover. It was behooving to St. Peter. The old fisherman didn't have enough education to sign his own name. But one day, when he was going through the beautiful gate, that Solomon had built. There laid a man who was lame. His knees was weak, ankles. He couldn't walk. He had been that way. He had no strength. A man about 40 years old. And he had no strength. But when Peter heard the cup rattle, and he looked down and seen a crippled man laying there, and something pounded in his heart, he had been at Pentecost. He had the Holy Ghost. He had the promise of Jesus. So it was behooving, it was becoming to him that he said, silver and gold have I none. He gave his testimony. I have no silver and gold, but such as I have. I'll give it to you if you can receive it. I can imagine a man say, I can receive it. He said, then in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, stand on your feet and be made well. And he reached down and got him to exercise his faith and raised him up like that in his ankle. Bones received strength. And he went leaping, praising, glorifying God. Hallelujah. It was behooving him Amen. to do it. It was becoming to him. He should have done it because he was an anointed disciple. He had been with Jesus. The whole world knew the day before in the Sanhedrin court when he had him gathered up, him and John, both of them ignorant and unlearned. They knew that they had been with Jesus because they heard the way they were talking and the boldness they had. They knew that something had happened to him, and Peter knew that. So it was becoming Peter. It was becoming to him because he had God's promise for that day. Yes. Amen. I'll give you power. Amen. Mm. Amen. I'll give you power. You shall tread on the heads of serpents and scorpions. Whatever you ask in my name, that I'll do. If you say to this mountain, be moved and don't doubt it in your heart, but believe that what you said shall come to pass, you can have what you said. Right. It's behooving to Peter then to believe it. It's becoming him. That's what he should do. Because he knew he lived in the day of that commission. That was the light of the hour. The resurrection had just come. The Holy Ghost was there. It was becoming to him. It was becoming to St. Paul. After being a critic and on his road down to Damascus one day, there that pillar of fire that had led Israel from Egypt into the promised land that had been made flesh and dwelt among them and had returned back to God spoke to him and he wondered how could this be Jehovah? How could it be? And there he is in the same pillar of fire hanging out Lord, who are you that I persecute? He said, I'm Jesus. Oh my he commissioned him. Give him his ministry. Commission Paul. Give him his ministry. Paul had been in the presence of God. He'd seen the pillar of fire. He'd seen that Jesus that was once the pillar of fire had been made flesh and dwelt among us and returned back to the pillar of fire and commissioned him to his ministry. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Nothing's going to shake him. Amen. It was becoming to him when he took handkerchiefs off his body and sent to the sick. It was becoming to him because he knew he was an anointed apostle. Amen. Amen. Saw the visions of God and God appeared before him and spoke and seen it happen just exactly why it was becoming to Paul. They would try to help the people fulfill the word that he was commissioned. 
He was the light of the day. He was the light to the Gentiles. He knew it. God commissioned him to be. He was the light in that day. So he was commissioned to Paul. Now, it's becoming us. It's becoming to us. In this day, we know we've just been through the church ages. We know that we've received the Holy Ghost. We know that beyond a shadow of doubt. We know we have the gospel life. Repent, every one of you, and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. There is not a clergyman in the world or nothing else can defy that. How far should this be done? The promises to your children, to them, it's far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. The prophet said it will be light in the evening time. These gospel lights would turn back again. Like the same sun rises in the east and sets in the west. It shall return again in the last days. Here we are in the last days. We have received the Holy Ghost. We know that. We spoke in tongues. Like they did at Pentecost. And we know. If you can receive it. We know. That the seventh angel has given the message. We sit vindicated but sorry. We know we're at the end of the Lady of Sin age. We know that national strife, signs and wonders are appearing everywhere. We know that we're at the end time. God bearing witness. Then it behooveth us. It's becoming to us that we fulfill all righteousness. Nations against nations. Perplexed at time, distress. All these things that we have heard, if you can receive it. That we're at the last hour. Amen. We're in the Lady of Sin church age. Amen. Every messenger is give his age. Yes. Give his message in his age. And we're here at the end of the age. And we see that God has a vindicated with signs and wonders. Yes. Nobody can say it isn't so. Amen. He's here now. Amen. He's in the church. Yes. He's in the people. Thank you. Nobody can say it isn't so. Hallelujah. We know that He's here. Amen. It behooveth us to take His word. Yes. We it behooveth us to believe all righteousness. Amen. It's behooving to us. It's becoming to us. That we fulfill everything that he has spoke of. The church is weak. The churches of today. We're broke up in an organizational strife. Separation of brotherhood. Yeah. Methodist, Baptist, Presbyterian, oneness, threeness, fiveness. All kinds of stuff. We're broke up. That's the way it's supposed to be. It's got to be that way. Then there will come a message. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. We know that same pillar of fire that led Israel. We know that the same ministry that accompanied Jesus Christ by that pillar of fire that had him anointed is accompanying the church today. Amen. Science has proved it. We don't need that. God's proved it. We need the ministry of Jesus Christ to fit that headstone coming out of her has brought the church into a place to the ministry is exactly like it was when Jesus left. Amen. Exactly. Hallelujah. Nations are breaking Israel awaiting the signs that the sages foretold. The Gentile days numbered with horrors and comfort. Return, O dispers, to your own. We're in the last days. And it's behooving to us, it's becoming to us, that we fulfill all righteousness. Remember, Jesus said, as it was in the days of Lot, so will it be in the coming of the Son of Man. How many remembers that? All right, what was it in the days of Lot? What signs did he give? There was three classes of people in the days of Lot. Was that right? Amen. There was the unbeliever, the make-believer, and the believer. Amen. Each one of them received the messenger. That's right. When Abraham was sitting under his oak, what taken place? Look, what taken place? There was an angel came down and went down into Sodom. This man went down there and taught repentance to them. 
that they should repent and turn to God. What happened? Only three came out. Amen. Lot and his two daughters. His wife turned to a pillar of salt. Only three came out. When there was a modern Billy Graham, we shot the message down in there to him. And we see that happening today. Yeah. We see to the nominal church, we see a messenger going forth preaching. And there was one who came to Abraham in the elect church. He gave him a sign. We know that's true. We know it's a fact. He sat with his back turned to the tent, told who Sarah was, what was on her heart, what was her trouble. He gave the message exactly. Abraham knew that was God. For immediately after he said so, he called him Elohim. A messenger formed in human flesh to bring a message to a Sodom and Gomorrah. And when we see those things that Jesus said would come to pass, it's becoming to us that we fulfill all righteousness. It's becoming to us that we take God at His word. Do you believe that? Thus suffer it to be so now. Brother Branham, you're... You're, you're out of the cater with the rest of the nominations. That may be so. Suffer that to be so now. Amen. Amen. Suffer that to be so. Well, it, you'd be a lot better off if you'd go ahead and cooperate. Uh, suffer that to be so now. That, but thus, it's becoming to us. Amen. We are His people, His prophets, His sages. It's becoming to us that we fulfill all righteousness. Amen. So let us do that as we bow our heads. Nations are breaking, Israel's awakening, the signs that the Bible foretold, the Gentile days numbered with horrors encumbered, return, O oh, disperse to your own. A day of redemption is near, man's hearts are failing for fear. Be filled with the Spirit, your lamps trimmed and clear. Look up, your redemption is near. False prophets are lying. God's truth they're denying. That Jesus the Christ is our God. How true that is. But we'll walk where the apostles have trod. For the day of redemption is near. Man's hearts are failing for fear. Be filled with the Spirit. Have your lamps trimmed and clear. Look up. Your redemption is near. While you have your heads bowed, is it becoming to you this morning that you give your life to Christ as He spoke to you? If so, just raise your hand to Him and say, I now accept Christ. It's becoming to me that I surrender my all, my will this morning to Him. I now raise my hand and say, Lord Jesus, be merciful to me. I need Thee. Oh, how I need Thee. Every hour I need Thee. God bless you. Oh, blessed Savior. I come to thee. I need thee, Lord. Why do you remain one mother's name now? Every hour I need
down through the valleys we walk. Knowing that you promised I'll not leave thee, neither will I forsake thee. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All other things will be added unto him. So I come to you. If there be any here, Lord, who is not right in their soul, if they were coming down that trail that my mother is right this morning, oh Lord, may they have that testimony to you. It's behooving to us today, Lord. We're at the Eden Road. The Lady of Sin Church is the message, the rejecting of the message, the vindication of the message, the presence of Christ, proving He's the same yesterday, in the days of Lot, as in the days of His flesh, and in the days today, yesterday, today, and forever. Let them receive you now as their blessed Savior. Grant it, Lord, I ask in Jesus' name. Oh, Mrs. Nance. She 
She's in Madisonville, Kentucky. That's right, isn't it, Lenny? You can raise your hand. You, you had your hand up and just kept it up. That's true, wasn't it? If it is, raise your hand. See where we're living at, friend? I don't know that lady. I've never seen her. What is it? It's the sign of the gospel. But you might, do you believe me to be his prophet, lady? You do? Yet we're strangers. I don't know you. That name was right, wasn't it? If it's all right, whatever he told you, just, just wave your hands to the audience so they can see if that was right. What could do that? Jesus of Nazareth. Amen. That you might know that I be God's prophet in telling you the truth. For thus it behooveth us. A woman touched his garment. And he turned and told her her blood issue. Instead of this stop, the lady sitting next to you also has a heart trouble too. That's right. Yeah. I don't know her. You know I don't know her. But God knows her. He knows her trouble, doesn't he? Ms. Allen, do you believe that God can make you well? If that's your name and your trouble, raise up your hand. Raise up your hand if that's right. A lady sitting next to you there, I mean Mrs. Bennett. You're all in the same place. She has kidney trouble instead of heart trouble. You believe with all your heart you can be made well too. Do you do it, lady? Raise up your hand and say, I'll accept it. Then you go home and get well. If thou canst believe. You're down in Kentucky. A city called Madisonville. Sitting right back there, a lady, Mrs. Bone. She's near Madisonville. She don't live right in Madisonville. She's looking right at me. There's that angel standing right over. She just lives near Madisonville. Her name is Bone. Sinus trouble, asthmatic condition, coughing. If that's right, wave your hand back and forth, lady. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and go home and be well. Throat trouble, sir. Do you believe that God can heal throat trouble and make you well? Be healed. Just have faith in God. Miss Hopkins, the colored lady from Chicago. I don't know you. Never seen you in my life. But you want to be healed of that nervousness? Sinus trouble? Go believe. You can be well too. Mrs. Haynes from Columbus, Ohio. You believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. You go home and be well too. We're on the end road. You believe him? It behooveth us to fulfill all righteousness. Amen. He promised those things to be. We're here. Do you believe it? Amen. Amen. Well, put your hands on one another. I want to ask you a question. Did Jesus promise these things would be in the last days? Say amen. amen. As it was in the days of Lot. The works that I do shall you also. Did he also say this? These signs shall follow them that believe. If they lay their hands on the sick, they shall recover. Are you ready to take your stand? Yes. A believer? Yes. For thus it is becoming to us that we fulfill all righteousness. It's the righteousness of God that when these handkerchiefs here I lay my hands on in the name of Jesus touches you. I know the Holy Ghost is here. The same one that was with Paul. They're taken from Paul. So should you be healed if you'll just believe it? I believe the same Holy Ghost, the Bible Holy Ghost is here this morning, proving itself. The message of the last days, the 
the great Holy Spirit Himself, impersonating Himself, coming into human flesh, doing His work. I stood this morning under a difficult. You know just about what I'm fixing to hear when I leave here. But it's the coming of us. That all righteousness be fulfilled. God put the message on my heart. Now it's becoming to you as a believer that you believe while you've got your hands on one another. There will not be a sick person on this. Amen. You just Amen. Are you ready to take your stand? Thank you, Jesus. Our Heavenly Father, we bring to you this audience after this message. We praise and thank you. Lord God, surely the people can see now that it's becoming to us. It's becoming to a prophet to stand on the Word. It's becoming to a member of a church. It's becoming to them that they stand on. It's becoming to the sick people to believe the word of Jesus Christ. When he said, these signs shall follow them that believe. If they lay their hands on the sick, they shall recover. I was going to call that prayer line, Lord, but the message that says well, to me by the phone is shook me, Father. We thank you for it. Oh, God. Your word says it's becoming flesh that we fulfill all righteousness. According to thy word, we here they are each one, the Holy Ghost here proving that he's among us. Now let the power of God, let the witness of the Holy Ghost move into the hearts of these people just now, giving them an assurance like Daniel had, like Noah had, like Enoch had. Like John had, like Peter had, like Paul had, like Jesus had, like Abraham had, like all of them had, Lord, that it's becoming to us in this age where divine healing power is poured out. Signs and wonders are being done. Great awakening has come among the people. The Holy Spirit has dropped among the people. They have shouted, spoken tongues, prophesied. Great uh, gifts yeah. and signs and wonders. The angel of the message, the angel of the age has appeared to us in the form of the Holy Ghost. Uh, and he's bringing us the message. We see it being fulfilled. Amen. We see him taking our bodies and transforming us from mortal human beings into agents of God to speak forth great mysterious signs and wonders. Amen. When we see these things, Thank you, Jesus. then it is becoming to us. That we fulfill all righteousness. Bless the name of the Lord. When we know that Abraham looked back to Lot. That when Daniel could look to Abraham. That when John could look to Daniel. Oh God. That when Peter and John could look to Jesus. And when we can look to them. And today we see the same results among us. Then it's becoming to us. That we fulfill all righteousness. That the power of Jesus Christ surge this building. Amen. With divine faith and heal every person in here of every affliction and every disease, Lord. And as your servant, I charge this devil that's pushed me all morning, that's trying to make me get out of this pulpit. By the grace of God, I've stayed here. For these poor, sick, suffering mortals, thank God. Come out of here, you devil. I charge thee by Jesus Christ, the living God, that you depart from these people and bother them no more, for they stand like the Hebrew children in the hour of trial to take their stand as being healed from this hour on. Through Jesus Christ's name, I charge the sickness and devils of this congregation that's come to sicken these people to depart from them. With our heads bowed, our hearts to God. I'm going to sing a song. I'm going to try it with your help. God's help. My faith looks up to thee. I don't want you to doubt one bit. I want you to believe now. It is becoming to us. Amen. How many Christians are in here? Raise your hands and say amen. 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 How many believers say amen? Amen. amen. 
How many has laid your hands on others say amen? Amen. amen. Then it is becoming to us Hallelujah. that we fulfill all righteousness. My faith. Brother Neville, my blessed associate pastor. Uh, 